Welcome back to another episode of Introductory Organic Chemistry. Today we're going to talk about aldol condensations. But before we get into that, let's go over the problems I assigned last lecture. So in the first problem, I gave you these two different uh, compounds. So first we have this Michael acceptor on the left and this enamine on the right. And so the question is, given these E and N parameters, we're supposed to predict whether or not the reaction will happen. So first, looking at this enamine with an N of 11.4, we put that into our equation right here. And then we subtract the E parameter value of our electrophile, which is minus 29.6. And from this, we get a net of minus 18.20. And as this reaction has to have an N plus E ideally above minus 5 for any reaction to occur, we can see that there's no way that this reaction will ever occur. So if we wanted to make this product, we'd have to do it using some other method. Now in the next reaction, we have this malleimide with this primary amine and with this value of uh, 10.13 as our nucleophilicity value, minus 14.23, uh, we'll have a sum of minus 4.1. And as this is within our range of acceptable N plus E values to see a reaction kinetically occurring, we would expect this reaction can work. However, it'll be slow. In our final problem, we had maleic anhydride. And maleic anhydride is a decent electrophile as well. However, this type of enamine is a much worse nucleophile. However, if we add the sum of these two together, we'll still see that we have a net of minus 5.67, which will be a slow reaction, but it will still occur. And so with that, let's get into today's material. Aldol condensations. So when we're doing an aldol condensation, there's several things to consider. One, we need to have an enolizable ketone or aldehyde, so something with alpha protons. We also have to have an electrophile such as an aldehyde or a ketone, specifically something containing a carbonyl, but for good reactivity, we'll need usually an aldehyde or a ketone. More often than not, we'll see aldehydes used, however. When we look at our condensation products, there's two different types of products we could form. We could form the E or the Z alkene, and because the R groups are not clear here, they're ambiguous, I haven't labeled one as E or Z, just to show that um, there are different products that could form, potentially. However, most of the time we form the antigagan alkenes, which means opposite, because the bulky groups will try to oppose each other whenever possible for steric bulk reasons. So uh, we have two different mechanisms that this reaction can, be, uh, can go by. So first we can treat our ketone with a base, when this occurs, we'll form our enolate, similar to what we saw in our uh, Michael addition reactions, our conjugate addition reactions. However, instead of using an alkyl halide or some other uh, electrophile, such as an alpha beta unsaturated ketone, here we just have a ketone, so we're undergoing 1,2 addition. So this will attack a ketone or an aldehyde. Under subsequent treatment with uh, water, we'll be able to protonate this alcohol, which will make it a slightly better leaving group. The presence of base can deprotonate the alpha position, which will form an enolate, but I've kind of simplified here just to show that it can eliminate this uh, hydroxy group relatively easily, reforming water. So this would afford either the E or the Z product. Here it's still not clear whether this is E or Z because three or three and four aren't clear. But if, uh, if we're assuming R4 is the larger group, this would be an E alkene. And if R3 was the smaller group, then this would be the Z alkene. Now, in addition to the use of base, you can also use acid. So here, instead of protonating, instead of deprotonating our nucleophile, we protonate our electrophile. So by protonating the carbonyl of the uh, electron acceptor, the electrophile, it becomes more electrophilic. So for an aldehyde, aldehydes are usually already electrophilic enough, but if we wanted to react something like a ketone, we would need harsher conditions, either a base or an acid, to make these reactions go. So here we can see the carbonyl is protonated, and then the enol form of the ketone is able to attack. And here I've shown that the keto and the enol form is an equilibrium that can occur. Most of the time when you have a ketone, however, it will predominantly lie in its keto tautomer form and not very much in its enol form. Now, if this enol was in conjugation with another carbonyl or another um, similar electron withdrawing group, we would actually see the enol predominating. So in this case, when some of the enol form is present, we're able to undergo nucleophilic attack at the protonated carbonyl. This allows the electron density to swing up onto the oxygen and we then can have a proton transfer from the protonated carbonyl to the hydroxy group, which when protonated as water is a great leaving group, and that allows water to deprotonate the alpha position. So instead of having hydroxide deprotonate the alpha position, as we saw in the base mediated case, here we would have water deprotonating, as we couldn't have a base under such acidic conditions. So once the water is eliminated, we again have an E and a Z product, 
Now in this case, if this was to be the E product, R3 would have to be the bulky substituent as R3 and the carbonyl would be the two priority groups on an alkene. If you're not sure how we determine whether an alkene is E or Z, I would recommend you check out the video that we've made on that. Now, when we look at aldehydes and ketones, they have different electrophilicities. So last lecture, when we were talking about conjugate additions, we talked a lot about nucleophilicity and electrophilicity. So carbonyls can react with nucleophiles. They also have electrophilicity values. Um, so ketones typically have E parameters in the range of minus 15 to minus 22. However, there's only about 10 ketones that have experimentally determined E parameters. Now, unfortunately, there's only one aldehyde with an experimentally determined E parameter, and that's benzaldehyde with an E of minus 13. However, when you take something like benzaldehyde and you treat it with a Lewis acid, such as boron trichloride, it becomes way more electrophilic, like way, way more electrophilic, like a trillion times more electrophilic. And so, or even more, in this case, it'd be a hundred trillion times. So we go from minus 13 to 1.12. That's a huge difference in electrophilicity. So if you don't want to use a really harsh Lewis acid like boron trichloride, you can also treat them with secondary amines. So in this case, we've taken piperidine and that's just dehydrated uh, benzaldehyde to form this amenium. And in this case, the E value is around minus nine. So that's about a fourfold increase in reactivity. Uh, sorry, a fourfold increase in E parameter, which would correspond to 10,000 times increase in reactivity. So imines can also uh, catalyze these reactions quite a bit. So one example reaction is if we take the following um, enolyzable ketone, this like phenyl uh, acetophenone, and we treat it with benzaldehyde in the presence of base, we could get the E or the Z product. Now here you can see that this is antgagan, it's opposite because the carbonyl containing group is opposite from the, the phenyl ring, while the proton on this alkene is on the same side. So the phenyl group takes priority, the, the uh, benzoyl group also takes priority over the phenyl group on this side. So that's why this is the antgagan product. And the reason why this reaction works is if we look at the N parameter of this enolate, here we have an N of 23.15. And if we look at the electrophilicity of benzaldehyde without any activator or imine, we have an E of minus 12.9. And so when we plug this into our little equation here, we have a sum of 10.25. And so this is gonna be a really, really fast reaction. So if you wanted to do this reaction, you'd have to probably cool it. Otherwise it would run away and make lots of side products just due to the how exothermic the reaction would be. And so with that, I'd like to assign a couple practice problems for this lecture. First, we take this uh, tert butyl um, methyl ketone and we treat it with benzaldehyde in the presence of a base. And I want you to predict what the product would be. And it's also important to consider whether we have the E or the Z isomer of the product forming. Additionally, if we were to take acetone and treat it with a base, it can undergo a few different condensation reactions. First, it makes something called mesidyl oxide and then it forms isoferone under subsequent reactions. Now, I haven't drawn the structure of mesidyl oxide because it would be too much of a giveaway and it would be very intuitive for how this reaction occurs. Um, so I'd like you to try drawing the self-condensation reaction of acetone, look at the product of that reaction and see if you can figure out how isoferone is formed. You might need to use some of the conjugate addition chemistry that we talked about in the last episode, but I think it's a relatively straightforward problem and it's a useful, uh, practice problem to understand how side reactions happen. And so fun fact, so in my first summer research, uh, summer of research, my friend had been doing a reaction in acetone and he decided to use sodium methoxide as a base. And when he did the reaction, it turned to this like reddish pink color. And so he did gas chromatography mass spectrometry on it. And it and it ended up showing this isoferone product. And we're like, what on earth is isoferone? I don't know what this is. I don't know how it formed, but it smelled quite nice. And so we ended up reading into it. And this is why I'm mentioning this reaction today. However, it happens to be particularly relevant to the material at hand. And so with that, I hope this has been a useful lecture on the uh, aldol condensation reaction. In the next lecture, we'll talk more about aldol additions where we don't form the alkenes, but rather the hydroxy group is retained. And so with that, I hope if you have any questions or comments, you'll leave them below. And if you have any feedback or comments about how you think this series could be done better, I'd be happy to hear them in the comments. With that, have a great day.